after memory loss. Oh, is that part of mold too? No. Short <laughs> <laughs> term memory loss. Jesus. I'm breathing in all the mold. Is that why? That no. Oh, what was it? We had we had had a whole thing we were gonna do and we were just cracking up. We couldn't stop laughing. I know. Oh, you know what it was? You know what, what? it was? What? You had said something about hold on, and I started singing Wilson Phillips. Oh my gosh, that's right. You were and, singing uh, Wilson Phillips. And I was like, Sit the front of the front make you cry. And then you call Wilson Phillips the uh White Camp Low. The White Camp Low. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm your host, Jason Miles, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. Thank you all for joining us. We have a bit of a controversial show tonight, and I'm sure many of you are excited to check this out. But before we start, if you're new to the channel, please hit like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you are alerted whenever we go live. We are constantly adding new shows and doing cross streams with other channels. Speaking of shows, Pascal Robert will be following up this show today with another heater with Dr. Paul McComb, Jama Baraka, and du Daruba Ben Wahad. Wow, that's going to be a good one. If you want to be part of the live audience and participate in that conversation, there's only one way to become a patron for as little as $3 a month or $30 for the year. You can have access to champagne rooms, past and present, and be a part of the live audience for the Mau Mau Hour with Pascal Robert and join us for the raucous fun that is movie night. That voice that you heard with me as we were trying to figure out what exactly Wilson Phillips was saying and hold on. <laughs> Them Toussaint, please welcome Them Toussaint. Hello, hello. Welcome everyone. Let's discuss my last name today. Oh yeah, this is a this is a big show for our Haitian contingent, all five of you. Yes. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of Haitians that watch the show because when you see the patrons, mm -hmm. there's long French names. I just assume you and Pascal know these people. Yeah, <laughs> we're best friends. I just, that's what I assume. Yeah. Um, as we were saying off air, there's a large Haitian community. Um. It's probably going to be interested in this show that maybe some of the things we're going to talk about are going to be kind of myth breaking for them right think? i think so i mean um you know not to to make a play on your condition but uh we might clear some sinuses today. <laughs> we might do that you leave my congestion out of this a little, a little outsoids my, action i can still do my wilson phillips we can better make you cry. Save her, baby. We can better put a nigga in the eye. Yes. Hold on for one more day. 
I want everyone black that's watching the show to be like, I thought I tuned into a Haiti episode. <laughs> Maybe it was on Black Power Media. I'll check this. <laughs> wrong channel. <laughs> it's got to be the wrong channel. <laughs> Pascal does not think my Wilson Phillips impersonation is is funny. No, no. He is he is sitting. If you guys could see him right now, if he had a Captain Crunch hat, he would be so ready to go. This is so true. So Let's true. bring him in now. Let's bring him in. <laughs> He's ready to come in. Our guest today has been on the show, I think, about 400 times. There's wow. about 400 episodes I think our guest has been uh, featured in. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. I, th- I think you guys know him as my homie, my dog, the man of the Mau Mau Hour. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, M2 Sump. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. What's up, man? Mm-hmm. What is up? Oh, man. Uh, I'm calling this because, you know, I, I, I label all the the intros to the guests. Destroying the myth of Toussaint Le Overture. Come on. I'm, I'm probably going to say it so wrong with my horrible Spanish accent trying to talk French. So. First, can I introduce the image that is behind me and who are the individuals? Please, please. Please. The, the figure that is on this shoulder here with the blue background is a picture, an image of Toussaint Le Overture. Obviously, these men, uh, from what I understand, did not pose for paintings so these are speculative art depictions mm-hmm. and the man on this shoulder is an image of Desaline, which you can tell with the blue and red flag which is the flag that was uh created at the uh, treaty of akaya on may 18th 1803 which is haitian flag day and now that flag was made is that the french flag which is called the tricolor or the tricolor which is blue white and red they said let us rip the white out and make it blue and red and Ooh. that's how they got that flag um jb says wait neither is a picture of wyclef um, <laughs> thank god thank god i will <laughs> also neither a shakira either that's that's <laughs> that would be my dad's concern. Where is Shakira? Is Where is Shakira? <laughs> Can Wyclef do a version of Hold On by Wilson Phillips? <laughs> Probably. Sounded like Kermit the Frog. He's really doing it right now. Hold on on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will add that that these are, you know, obviously they're idealized. They're They're not, you know, paintings that anyone sat for. But we do have historical descriptions of what they look like. And that is what these are definitely based on. Is this, right. So is this like in black people's houses where there's always a picture of like Obama, MLK, and black Jesus? Is it the same thing for Haitian people? There's Overture and Desalines or no? Depending on who you are, you'll see more pictures of one than the other. Mm-hmm. I will tell you this, in my house, we did not have a picture of uh, either one of them. We had a small... Uh, bronze sculpture of Lovature's head that used to be right on top of our refrigerator. And we had a huge painting of the Citadel, which was a fort that was built by Henry Christophe, which is in the north of Haiti. It's literally the largest fortress in the Western Hemisphere up until this day. We had a big painting of that in the living room. Um, I'll say that I would go to my friend's house and they had a poster of the heroes and it says like the heroes at the top and had a picture it had a drawing of Louverture, Dessaline, Henri Christophe, um Petion yes. and Bo- and Bolivar actually. Oh, Simon <laughs> Bolivar. Simon Bolivar, which confused me for a very long time until I learned a bit more history. Um so Conan Neutron was here a few days ago or last week and there's this really there's an elementary school in downtown Rosarito and we were walking by it and there's this picture of Abraham Lincoln this is to the same movement and and um Benito Juarez 
And I don't think they ever met each other. Mm. The Lincoln administration appreciated you know, Juarez, you know, and helped them, right? And I was trying to show Conan the picture because it's, it's such an odd picture to see you're just walking in downtown Rosarito and all of a sudden there's this massive mural of Abraham Lincoln. And I was trying to show, I was like, oh, look, it's over there. But the school was in session because it was so early. And we looked like two creepy dudes trying to <laughs> check out the school. Because yeah. I was like, I don't, I don't, I was like, you know what? Let's, just, I'll forget it. I'll show it to you later. I get older and they stay the same age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Yeah, it was not the time to have a Matthew McConaughey moment. <laughs> well, Pascal Robert is often a guest on larger shows to discuss contemporary Haitian politics and a bit of Haitian history. But in an upcoming mini book that is being edited as we speak in a series of essays, Pascal takes on the notion that Toussaint L'Overture was the liberator of Haiti. He argues quite the contrary, that L'Overture was maybe as much of an enemy to the Haitian people as their French counterparts. From the upcoming piece, a true crime of history with over 200 years of negative consequences for black politics and black political thought is that the most important black liberation struggle in all humanity is narrated in a way to make the hero a black man that in the history of Saint Domingue and the Haitian Revolution did the most to protect the very slave system that black people spent over 200 years fighting against. Toussaint L'Overture. How did this happen? Because black compradors or what Malcolm X pejoratively called House Negroes in Haiti, America, and the Black diaspora have always wanted to be just like Toussaint L'Overture. And because the majority white ruling class has de desperately needed Black compradors and collaborators since the start of the transatlantic slave trade, what better way to politically confuse Black liberation efforts than by making the chief collaborator with the slaveocracy the hero of the greatest Black liberation story in 200 years? Toussaint L'Overture is the premier example of the Black Comprador collaborator or Black neo-colonial bourgeoisie for uh, post the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. He was the enemy of the Black liberty that thankfully Dessalines and his army brought to life. All you need to know about Toussaint L'Overture is that he was the idol of American Southern slave owners who lived while he governed San Domingue pre-revolutionary Haiti. 1797 and 1801. Now, Pascal Robert, we talked earlier today about just just real brief about you growing up in Haiti and having these. Even just now on the show, mentioning you had these images of Toussaint. Growing up in America, I didn't grow up in Haiti. I grew up in America. American Haiti, <laughs> also known as Queens. Also known as Queens. <laughs> Cambria Heights, to be exact. <laughs> But you grew up with these images around you of this this man that is is said to be the liberator of a nation. Where did you find out? When did you first find out that this narrative might not be true? And well, what what brought you to make this the focus of your work? This is a really interesting story. I'm glad you asked that question. You are so perceptive, Jason. Um, I was just my mom just finished this piece today. For those who are asking about the piece and why it's not up. The piece is 21 pages, 8,000 words, not including footnotes. So it's going to be put in some various journals and publications, probably translated into a book, but it's going to be recirculated into small online you know, publication articles and kind of online magazine posts as well. But to the direct question Jason asked is that um, in my house, both of my parents came from very educated Haitian families, but different types. My mom comes from the core, what the what you would call the more light-skinned bourgeois, or the people of Pétion, if you will. My father comes from the more dark complexion, petit bourgeois, or the people of Dessalines or Louverture, if you will. My my father and mother, from the time I was born until literally the time I was in college, never said a word about the Haitian Revolution or Haitian history. They taught us nothing about it. The first time I discovered anything about Haitian history or the Haitian Revolution, when I was 21 years old, 
my best friend from high school, shout out to Gary Dolphin, was had just graduated the same year I did. And he was uh, very interested in the then coming election of Aristide. And he knew that I didn't, he knew about the history of the Haitian Revolution because I know his father, you know, and uh, uh, rest in peace to uh, his dad, who was a great, his dad and my dad were very close friends. You know, uh, Jean Dauphin, who was a general in the Haitian Navy. His dad and my dad were very close. Rest in peace to Jean Dauphin. Um, so he, he grew up understanding and knowing this history. And when he gave me a book when I was 21 years old, and he gave it to me because he knew I did not know the history of Haiti or the Haitian Revolution. And the book he gave me was C.L.R. James, The Black Jacobins. And I was like, what the hell is this? And I start reading this book. I'm literally, my first reaction is I'm furious. And you know, I'm furious because I'm like, why the hell? Did my parents never tell me this story when well, it could have helped me avoid feeling like crap when kids were calling me the little coconut head AIDS carrier when I was in elementary school, when I was getting teased all the time because my parents were Haitian, where well, people would, would call me all kinds of names, things that Haitian kids go through all the time. Why the hell didn't Tate tell me this story? It could have helped me avoid the problems and the crap that uh, tons of Haitian kids all over the country go through. And I told my mom, we were talking about this, this is a true story that happened in Miami, Florida. A teenage Haitian kid in Miami committed suicide because his black American girlfriend found out he was Haitian. Wow. This happened in the 80s or 90s in Miami. <clears throat> it's a wow. fact. So I went to my dad and I was pissed by this time, my dad and I were close. I, when I grew up, I don't know if I told you this before, I was terrified of my father. Mm -hmm. People ask me what, what, my, what my father was like. I'm going to give you a description. My father was James Evans Sr. from Good Times with stable <laughs> employment and a Haitian accent. So you're saying your father never had to get the pool cue is what you're telling us. No. Oh, I no, James, don't get the pool cue. In terms of his physical, my father was very muscular. The whole flaring nostrils. He had more stable. My father was a car mechanic, so he always had a good job. Money wasn't a problem. But in terms of, imagine James Evans Jr. with a car mechanic's good middle class income with a Haitian accent. And that's you, you that's literally my father. And you were Michael, or were you more? Jr.? I was more Michael than Jr. Yeah. So basically, what I'm trying to tell you is that I grew up, I grew up terrified of my father. Literally. So what ends up happening, right? I'm applying to law school and I'm re reading my history. And by the time I'm, I'm about to apply to law school, my father and I had kind of made peace. We were very close. We were like buddies. As a matter of fact, people used to be shocked compared to how I was so terrified of him as a kid, how close we became. By the time I was like 21, up until my father died, I used to call him by his first name. I used to call him Ray or Reno. Like I just, we used to talk, we, used to, we became very close. And I told him that, and I was pissed after I read The Black Jacket. Was, I, I said, why the hell did you write? I said, you know how much hell you could have saved me in this history? And he looked me straight in the eyes. And I knew how intense my father is. My father was a, is a very intense, very terrifying guy. My father looked me dead in the eye. He said, you want me to know why I didn't tell you the history of my country? I said, why? I said, because I know. I told you the history of Haiti and the Haitian Revolution. I was afraid you'd hate white people for the rest of your life. Ooh. Wow. Oof. I said, whoa. Now, the thing is funny, right? Those of you who watch this show who know me know that one of the first things I said when we did our first early episodes at Jason's Know is that Pascal would say is that I'm not too big of a fan of uh, the Alabasters. Mm hmm that's without my father giving me this information and I learned it on my own. Imagine what I would have been like if he actually had taught me the history as a youth. But as far as the history of Dessalines and... and uh... No, I want to get to the point. Mm -hmm. When I started to ask my... When I, after we broke through that ice, 
-hmm. And I started talking to my dad about the figures in the Haitian Revolution. And I, I mentioned Toussaint Louverture. The first thing, we were in the base, I remember my dad, the first thing my father said, he said, Pascal, stop with Louverture. Louverture wanted to be a white man his whole life. All right? Mm -hmm. Haitian men who know Haitian history never even mention Toussaint Louverture. My father told me something that conf I was that I confirmed later on, but I forgot. He said, "Do you know what the name of uh, you know that when in the military, right? There's always <laughs> like a a place where the soldiers, like the high-ranking generals, like they're like they lodge their hall where they go where they drink, where like the officers, like the, yeah. the officers club, yeah, you know, like the officers club of of any country." It's like a big deal with a high-ranking general, yeah. all right? Mm -hmm. My father said, you know what the name of the officers' club is in Haiti? He said what? Mm -hmm. Kazen de Saline. I said, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. That's sending me a message. <laughs> so he said, every time my father thought I didn't believe something he said, mm -hmm. he would say, go ask his younger brother, because Ulrich was like the nerd of the family. My uncle Ulrich was still alive. Who's like my? He's like the Yoda to my Jedi. I call him <laughs> okay. So he said, "Go ask Eric." So I said, "I said, Eric, my father said that to say he said, don't even mention that bastard to me." I said, <laughs> I said, "Okay." So pretty much, and this is what this is what the ultimate. Now my mom is my mom doesn't have any of this heat at all. You know, my mom comes from a religious family. My mom's great grandfather was an Episcopal bishop, right? Mm -hmm. So I go to my mom and I'm like, Mom, what do you think about Destiny? I mean, two cell with you. She goes, Please. <laughs> Whoa. It's okay. This is interesting. <laughs> I said, mm -hmm. this is, this is, I'm in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, I'm like, Okay, clearly this cat is not the man that everyone thinks he is. Mm. And that kind of started me on this journey. Yes. To to find out more. Now, Tucson, do you want to ask this next question? Because I think it's kind of an important one. Uh, which number is it? Two. Two. Number two. Okay. Um, does Tucson have to be a superhero or a supervillain? Can he be allowed to? Can he be allowed the personal complexity of, say, a W. E. B. Du Bois or a Robespierre? That's a very, very good question. And I'm going to tell you something right now. In writing this piece, I did something that I never did before. And if you guys follow me on social media, after writing this piece, it caused me to have something that I've never had before. It caused me to actually have some sympathy for two seven mature. And the proof that I could do that is that if you look at my Instagram and my Facebook, one of the recent images I put up is one of the most popular pictures of two cent overture you can find. And I, I, there, if you notice, there are very few pictures. The only picture of overture I have on my page, I think, is that one. But I put a very classic picture of her up, and this was literally less than two, two or three days ago. And I put that up because after writing this piece and reflecting on, I was like, you know what? I really feel bad for the old man. Why? Because people don't understand, and you won't get that until you read this piece, why he was the way he was. Because Two Settler Wachure was literally an old man. You do mention that that he's he's much older, and that both of these men are actually born in Haiti, right? And was Tucson a mulatto? No, neither one are mulattoes, right? Both of both of these guys' parents on all sides were Africans. Yeah, but 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 they were born in Haiti. Right. The key difference. Mm -hmm. This is this will explain everything. The key difference between Toussaint Louverture mm -hmm. and Georges jacques Dessalines is a matter of age. And proximity to freedom of slavery mm -hmm. and what kind of slaves they were. I want to explain this in five minutes. Can I, you, well, yeah, because you you do. I want to, you know, give some context to this because you actually mentioned that was a Tucson Overture was a freed man of color. 
Yes, he was. A, he was a free person of color yeah. for fifteen so. for fifteen years before the Haitian Revolution begins. Forty eight mm -hmm. at the time of the revolution, you say, where Dessaline is thirty three. Yes, big difference. Go ahead. By the way, uh, uh, M two son. Mm -hmm. When have you ever heard Haitians when they talk about the Haitian Revolution make those distinctions? Never. Never. I was amazed to see their ages in there. Let me tell you something. When I told listen, my uncle Eric and my aunt uh, uh, Yoyo pretty much know their history. I asked both of them, you know when year two second when she was born? They're like, no, I don't. You know when year Desalini was born? I said, no, I don't. I said, you're proving my point. Most Haitians didn't even ask that question. <clears throat> Toussaint Louverture was born in 1744. Jean-Jacques Dessalines was born in 1758. The Haitian Revolution starts in 1791. Toussaint Louverture got free in 1776. He was 33 years old. In 1776, Dessalines was 18 on a plantation getting his ass beat. Because mm -hmm. he and was on a plantation. What did you say? Overture had slaves, correct? Overture was didn't only own slaves. He was a slave driver. He, he, he leased out land for the purposes of owning slaves to make money. This is covered in a book by Philip Girard, who does a bi biography of, of Louverture. Louverture had, was a very good businessman. He made, you know, he was very good in trading. He had commerce with other slave owners. For 15 years. Understand something. This is another thing. One of the things that shapes Toussaint Louverture's psychology is that early on he was told to believe, and some people believe it's true, that his grandfather was an African king in Africa, in the Haume, in Benin. Mm -hmm. And that hearing that he comes from African royalty shapes his sense of self-importance. So his father is shipped over from Benin or Dahomey, knowing that his grandfather was an African king. So his sense of self-entitlement starts very early on. And I'm going to be very honest with you. There's another thing that shapes what Toussaint Lohotia is. He was what Malcolm X would call classically a house Negro. He never had a hard day of field work in his life. He was very beloved by his masters. Now, if you read Adolf Reed's book, um, Stirring in a Jug, he makes a statement about Malcolm X's uh, House Negro speech. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, even though I love that speech, Malcolm X was wrong. And you know why he don't say that? He said, because there are lots of ex examples in American history of House Negroes being very revolutionary. He talks about Denmark Vesey, and that's very true. That's even true in the context of the Haitian Revolution. There were House Negroes who were part of the revolution. I mean, hell, there were some mulattoes who became very revolutionary as well. So the broad, paint this broad stroke that all house Negroes always had to be sellouts is also another myth right. that we should, we should try to collapse. But well, doesn't that kind of speak to kind of what you're doing in this piece, which is there's been oversimplifications over the decades because it is fiery rhetoric that gets people to want to join organizations or donate or want to be part of a movement, right? Grand right. narratives. And that's kind of the, the gift and the curse sometimes of grand narratives where they help us maybe grow cadre. They also always don't paint accurate portraits of what's going on to the, right. to the house Negro. Right. But in the case of Tuchel Overture, he was one of those house Negroes, sadly, who fits the archetype <clears throat> that Malcolm X describes in the house Negro field Negro speech. He loved, he literally, not only did he love, he didn't love all whites, 
he loved the big whites, or what in French they call the grand blanc, the big le cornon. The, the, in 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 a, in, Creole, in Haiti, they didn't call the, the plantation owner. They didn't call him master, like they did in America or massa. He was called le cornon. That was the name for the the owner of the place, le cornon. As a matter of fact, there is a curse. A lot of Haitians don't know this. That said in Haitian society, and I'm sure Toussaint Louverture has heard this before. Call and get my mom. Have you heard that before, Toussaint? Oh, sure have. Call and get my mom. That's something Haitian men say. Like, Call and get my mom. Call and get my mom. Most Haitians don't know where that comes from. Okay. Call and get my mom comes from the French word le colon getre ta mère, which means the slave master is giving your mama the look. He's about to put her on the back of the horse and take her mm. into the valley and give it to her. That makes sense because it's considered like the ultimate. It's, it's, it's considered like saying motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, but like worse. <laughs> it's yeah. the ultimate curse. Yeah. Call it's the worst thing you can say. Call on get my mom comes from Le Colon Get Katamere. What that means is that the slave masters would the, and when I learned, I was I was literally. This is after this is after I read. My father had a friend who uh his 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 son was is a good friend of mine on social media. He went to high school, elementary school with my brother. He's a bus driver in Queens, man. Uh um we call him Bono. I know Bono's watching the show, but Bono's dad, I am forget his name, his name. I went to I went to elementary school with his uh his sister too. But when he watched the show, he's know I'm talking about him. Bono's dad was like very respected by my father's crew, he knew the history. And I was like right out of college. I was in law school, and they knew I was doing a lot of research on history. history. And they had like with these things, these old guys used to do things like it was like almost kind of like mafia esque. Like they would all sit in a circle, and they would have him in the middle. And and he said he's in Pascal, and he and he basically is telling me the origins of this term that I heard all the time, calling it my mom. And he explains to me it means le colon get ta And I'm like, wow. Can I ask? For a, a little bit of context in terms of the house Negro, the type of house Negro that Toussaint Louverture was, he was actually given power. He was allowed to ride horses. He was allowed to command people. This wasn't like I'm washing dishes in the house. No, he was a state. He was the. He was actually a. He was better than a house Negro. Negro. Yes. He was the stable man. He's not the stable boy. He right. worked in charge of the horses. Right. Could he read? Yes. He learned how to read very early on. Not at a high... He was not universe. Because you got to understand something. The mulattoes in pre-revolutionary Haiti are being sent to France to get university education. Mm. So he has basically like elementary school level, French level ability to <clears throat> read and write. Which he was always ashamed of until his dying day. That Napoleon used to always make fun of him about the poor quality of his French. Napoleon used to get made fun of for his French too, right? It's true because Napoleon is actually Corsican. Right. All right. By the way, not to diss your your your, uh, your grandpapy, but um, do people know how tall Toussaint Louverture was? I don't believe people know. Would you like to tell me? Well, As I sit here with my father's sword in my hand. <laughs> well, according to one report, based on a description of him, he was five foot tall. Other reports said he was five foot four. We stand a short king. I mean. He was shorter than Napoleon. But weren't people shorter back then anyway? Depending on where you were from. Because don't forget, you have you have Africans who are coming from like certain parts of the world. Who like If they're, if they're Wolof, they're going to be five foot eleven. Hmm. The wall for a very tri a tribe of very tall Africans. Pascal over here yelling about people's height. Well, look, <laughs> you weren't there extracting bones, so. And Napoleon was supposed to actually be of average height, and that was a slight against him. Right. Let's uh, let's get back on task and yes, get out of trivia land. Yes. Tell us a little bit about Dessalines and what a contemporary history is leaving out or getting wrong about him. Uh, and another important thing about Dessalines, 
can you explain this uh myth not myth but the kind of story about him being the butcher of whites so first off who is Dessalines? okay and first of all Jean-Jacques Dessalines is born in 1758 uh he's basically a field slave his whole life who was brutally beaten from the womb to the beginning of the Haitian Revolution. That's the guy with the hat behind you in the That's red. The guy in the all red. Yes. His only saving grace is that he has an aunt named Toya, according to you know what the story is, is that her name was Toya. His aunt Toya is the woman who taught him how to fight so well. So she would actually give him training in how to fight and how to do hand-to-hand combat and make him, you know, she would like basically teach him how to fight. So he was known to be a very good fighter. He was very, very rebellious. He was so rebellious, he used to pride himself on taking off his shirt and showing other more, uh, you know, relaxed blacks and mulattoes, the lashes that he took. Like Denzel and Glory. Like Denzel and Glory, yeah. A friend of mine was on that was in that movie. He's yeah. in that scene. He used to pride himself on having people see the lashes on his back. He was enslaved by mostly whites most of his life, and the last he was the last slave master he had is the one that he's whose name he takes was a free person of color. I don't know if he was mulatto or black, but he was a free person of color named Desaline, and that person used to brutally beat him. And he took the name Dessalines, and from then on, he would be known as Jean Jacques Dessalines. Toussaint Louverture was born on the Breda plantation, and his name was actually Toussaint Breda. It's not until the beginning of the revolution that he takes the name Louverture. I actually have a theory about that because a lot of people don't know this. Mm-hmm. The word Louverture in, is the opening, Louverture yeah. is the actual name of the first chapter of the Quran, Al Fatiha, the opening. Interesting. So, yeah. Look at, look at, look at uh oh, here comes the numerology. Well, you know, well, <laughs> I just, I just wanted to add, in case people get confused, Toussaint is his last name. His first name is Dominique. Right. L- Louverture is a nickname. It means the opener, the one yeah. who makes a way. Yep. Just so it's clear. That's correct. Okay, you were saying. Yes. That's yeah. That's that's a, that's by the way the whole overture thing is I have a theory about that we're not gonna talk about that now we have to do a whole show about as that. long as numbers aren't involved no <laughs> it's gonna be a show about the role of Islam in the Haitian Revolution oh okay. Ma- and look. the aliens the aliens oh my God if you hotep out on us they I'm built the citadel there. Pascal if you start doing five letters E I E I I'm 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 not gonna go there but anyway they built the citadel the aliens. <laughs> I won't, I, won't, I won't go there, but anyway. <laughs> Haitian aliens. For for the for the champagne room, I will try to find that video of the dude explaining why old McDonald had a farm is satanic to children. But anyway, so back to Dessaline. So <laughs> Dessaline, Dessaline is uh, you know, basically a a, a a field slave who was brutally beat. And at, and at uh, 33 years old, we have ceremony Bwakaima, which is a ceremony where you have Bukman who you know, gathers all of the Africans in uh, at, at, in uh, in the mountains, and he basically tells them that you know the God of the whites wants you wants you to have misery, our God wants you to have justice, and a week after that, the fire and burning plantation starts all over the north and the Haitian, the insurgency that becomes the Haitian Revolution that starts. And Dessalines basically at that point, he's like, I'm never going to be a slave again. And that in 1793, when General Sontonax basically declares liberty, he's him and all blacks are free. And he's already starting to fight. And he moves up the ranks very quickly because he's such a good fighter. Mm-hmm. So that's how Dessalines gets his military experience. Yes. Excellent. Well, he, Dessaline, both Dessalines. And Louverture start fighting, start the Creole black generals start fighting for the Spanish. Because remember, the Spanish and the British want to, because the, the left side of the island 
of Hispaniola, which, which is called San Domingue, pre-revolutionary Haiti, Haiti, was the most valuable colony in the Western Hemisphere. It was more valuable than all 13 colonies together. That's why it used to be called the Pearl of the Antilles. So best, both the Spanish and the British are like, yo, we can take this from the French. And the Spanish jump in first and say, listen, all black Creole men, we're not going to free all you Negroes. We want these Africans to keep working. But you black Creole men, you come fight with us. We'll give you freedom. We'll give you a nice crib. You might get some land. You get some Spanish chicks you can hang out with. Nice. We make it nice for you. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> so they're like, word, 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 back. So they get down with the Spanish. But the Spanish, this is the key. What's the distinction? Both Dessalines and Loverture and the black Creole generals are born on the island. 65% of the black people in pre-revolutionary Haiti were born in Africa. Mm -hmm. They were the lowest of the low of the slaves. They were even lower than Dessalines. Right. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. So the black Creole generals are like, word? Okay, we, we'll go fight for Spain. We can get all these other Africans. We can, well, we can, well, we, we've been with, because by the way, there's a little fact. In pre revolutionary Haiti, by law, you can find this in Carolyn Fick's book, The Making of Haiti, only free people of color could be slave catchers. Free people of color, blacks, or free people of color, mulattoes. So these Negroes are like, oh, we've been, we've been waxing these Africans' ass for years. We can handle that, no problem. So they go fight for Spain and they're fighting against whatever ragtag the royalists. Don't forget, this is during the French Revolution. So the royalists, the king's army is, is there, or the Republican army, the Republican army is there. So they're like, okay, we're going to fight the Republican army, the French Republican army. And all of these rebellious Negroes who are burning plantations, you can't handle them, no problem. We've been kicking their ass for years. So the black and mulatto generals, some of the, so now the, some of the mulatto generals are like, well, fight for Spain, really? Okay, or they're like maybe we can deal with the British, because uh, what happens is 1793, freedom is given out, and a lot of the mulattoes don't want the Africans to be free. Right. Why? Because they, they hate them more than anyone. Because they're the bottom of the totem pole. Mm -hmm. The mulattoes are like, okay, we can deal with the mulattoes. Are like, okay, this you know, Loverture is black, but at least he's a free person of color like us. We can do business with him. All right, he wasn't educated in France. His French is kind of, you know, horrible. Yeah, his parents were born in Africa, but he's been free a long time. He did some good business. Yeah, Dessalines, yeah, he's a savage brute, but he can fight. We're not going to mess with him. He might beat our ass. I don't like that bastard at all, but we can handle Dessalines. We can handle Louverture. We can work with Louverture as long as he keeps his Dessalines guy in check and keeps him away from us. This is literally how these Negroes are thinking. I know this because I know Haitian people. And they still think this way to this day. Right. A Haitian person will literally look at you and know what class you come from in Haiti. Or they ask you where your family's from. Yeah. Like what part of Haiti? It's like reading your palm. Like, understand something. You could be in a room of all black people. And there's some Haitians be like, okay, Bosal. Creole, Enfanchi, uh, Ancien Libre, Nouveau Libre, down the line. 200 years after the revolution today. Imagine what it was like in the 1790s. Right. That's, now that's just amongst just black people. Not mulattoes, not light skinned people, just black people. And where do you fit in? I fit in. My mom was also light skinned Negroes. My father was some dark skinned Negroes, but my father's family were. This is interesting. My father's family are dark skinned Dessalinians on my father's father's side. My father's father is literally a descendant of Jean Jacques Dessalines. His father was a man named Constant who was born in Marchand de Saline. This is where de Saline literally made his capital. But his name was Constant. My grandfather's name was Robert because his mother's name, my grandfather's mother's name was Lamarcy Robert. And his father's name, last name was Constant. But they had what was called a marriage by plassage. 
They didn't have an official legal marriage. They had a marriage mm -hmm. contract. Mm -hmm. My grandfather, Wolbert, said, well, I like this Constant kid because he's descended from Dessalines, but I don't want him to have that goddamn Constant name. And she told my great-grandmother, name that kid Wolbert. I don't want him to have that Constant shit. And that's why my grandfather's name was Nicolas Wolbert, not Nicolas Constant. But all of his other siblings were named Constant. Interesting. You mentioned um, you are also related to Lovature. Yes, because my aunt Yo-Yo married a man named uh, what was uh, Degwart Toussaint. Where is he now? You made it sound Degwart like is dead. Crazy. But my cousin Jimmy lives in New York. Jimmy Toussaint is his name. Jean Vladimir Jeez. Toussaint. Jimmy Toussaint sounds like a uh, Haitian. <laughs> Over there, Jimmy Toussaint. Uh, he'll, he'll, he'll give you the thing for the thing. Jimmy Toussaint. God. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Is Jimmy's name Vladimir? Jean Vladimir Toussaint. <laughs> there we go. There That's we go. Jimmy hey, hey, hey. Not I was Jimmy. Jimmy. It's Jimmy. The other day. They call him Jimmy because of Vlad Jimmy. Vlad, John Vlad Jimmy Toussaint. Right. That's where that comes from. But I like Jimmy Toussaint. <laughs> yeah. can, we start, can we start calling you that Toussaint? It sounds like a numbers runner. Jimmy Toussaint my money. Fucking whack him. If you knew my cousin Jimmy, he literally acts like a numbers runner. He's like a jokester. <laughs> he acts like a numbers runner. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Jimmy is Uncle a wild Jimmy, boy. why do you have all those little slips in your pocket all the time? I can tell you stories about Jimmy Toussaint that will blow. Uh, there's a story that I have. I'm not going to say it now. It's too embarrassing. Jimmy's a wild, wild boy. All right. He's going to get the papers. Get the papers. Yeah. Jim, Jimmy, two cents. Jimmy, Jimmy, two cents. You'll get the papers. Get the two papers. cents over here. Two cents. <laughs> before, before we go into Jimmy, let's get back to, I want to, before we get into the Pascal's, uh, his own <laughs> personal historiography. Wait, I got I to gotta go back to my dad's family. This is going to get interesting. <laughs> I told you, right? I always <laughs> brag about how my father's a Dessalinian, Dessalinian. That's, that's only his father's side of the family, right? My mother, my, my grandmother, my father's mother has, there's a deed I have on Facebook that literally goes back to Alexander Petron. It's a deed to one of my ancestors who fought in the Haitian Revolution. His name was Colonel Paul Joseph Emile Valentin. Colonel Paul Emile Joseph Valentin. My, my grandmother's mother's last name was Valentin. Even though my grandmother's last name was a Polynese, because she also had a marriage by Plasage, a contract, contractual marriage. So my great grandfather's name was uh, Polynese, but my great grandmother's name was Valentin. She was a direct descendant of Colonel Paul Emile Joseph Valentin. And I have a deed uh, of land given from Alexandra Petron. It's on my Facebook page, given to my ancestor, Colonel. Paul Emile Joseph Valentin. Paul Emile Joseph Valentin was a mulatto. Paul Emile Joseph Valentin was also Alexander Petron's cousin. Wow. So what's as fascinating is that I didn't learn this until I met Paul McComb. He said, Mon cher, en Haïti, petit Dessaline, toujours besoin marié petit Petron, which literally means the children of Dessaline always want to marry the children of Petron. Being the dark skinned niggas who will come from big families always want to marry the light skinned chicks who come from big families, which is literally what my grandfather did, and which is literally what my father did. Oh, interesting. I wanna <laughs> I wanna ask how how we can understand uh these two historical figures. What can we relate them to? Like these these parallels, it's always imperfect. But uh, initially, I was like, is this kind of an MLK no, Malcolm X thing? Is it an MLK Stokely Carmichael thing? No, no that doesn't work either. Yeah. Why do you say no to that analogy, Pascal? Because that, that's because, because, because of age, too. Right. I think MLK, at some point in his life, uh -huh. becomes a radical figure. Mm -hmm. Lois would never becomes a radical figure. Lovachua dies begging Napoleon to send him back to his prior station. You said he died. I couldn't hear the last thing you said. Begging Napoleon uh -huh. to send him back to 
be, you know, basically, you know, yeah, he, to, yeah, the 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 governor general, yeah, like, yeah. In other words, he's not. He, he's asking, please give me a hearing to show I deserve to be what I was before. He's not like, fuck you, let me die. There's no, the tone of his voice. They have all of his writings. It's not like you know. It's like you know. He there's no uh, sense that he's like whatever. My country will be free. No, he's saying I want to go back and serve you. Well, let's just before we go because we're getting close to the end of the hour, and I think this is kind of going to be an interesting part of the the paper, especially for the people that watch this show. Mm-hmm. Um, after Dessalines uh, takes power, he does some land reform. He nationalizes the slave plantations. Why did he? Why did he nationalize the slave plantations, Jason? Well, you tell us. That's why you're here. Because the mulattoes, after they won the revolution, were saying, "Well, my white daddy owned this plantation. I want that land." My white daddy owned this plantation. I want that land. And the, a, and, and the Creole blacks were like, hey, man, I killed a lot of crackers for this land, man. I want to go. I want <laughs> Would you call him a proto-socialist? Yes. Really? Yes. Because of the Constitution and the land reform or just in general? The, national, the first step was in that. I had a long conversation with Paul McComb about this. Dessalines was pressured. Dessalines was brilliant. So was Louverture. Because he had to think on the spot. You have to understand the polit- This is why the problem with the Haitian Revolution, I'll be very honest, no one has done a dialectical materialist analysis of the revolution. The problem with CLR James is that he's stuck on the vindicationist. Look at what Toussaint Overture can do as a black man. And it clouds his ability to do the, the ultimate dialectical, dialectical material analysis of the class situation. There are three factions who want three economic models. The black Creole journals, generals want a mercantilist model. They want to have domestic plantations that have their goods shipped. They want protectionist laws so that other plantation materials cannot be coming to decrease the values of theirs. And they want to have the state protect their ability to trade their goods and wares inside the state and labor laws to def- make the labor work to their benefit. In other words, go back to the brutal corvée, semi-slave labor. So they want like feudalism. They want mercantilism. Yeah. The mulattoes want the plantations, but they don't want to run the plantations. They they want the ability to buy the the uh, all of the agricultural products from the black generals. Because they're light skinned and some of them look white, they know they'll be accepted in foreign ports and they want to do free trade. <clears throat> they want to do free trade. Mm-hmm. The Africans <laughs> don't want to be part of the Creole black plan because that means they're slaves. The Africans don't want to be part of the mulatto plan because they're still slaves. The Africans want anarcho-communism. They want an anarcho because they want the Laku system. The Laku system is a is a co- commune is a um, cooperative planting set system that in the Voodoo sector of Haiti they still do to this day. It's cooperative farming where you literally sh- go out, do the agriculture cooperatively, sh- bring all of your goods together, and you share it. You don't have to submit to the laws of the state or anyone else. You live in your voodoo communities. You live by your own communities. So they wanted that. So the Africans want to have a narco communism. So Dessalines is dealing with the Creole blacks who want mercantilism, the mulattoes who want free trade, and the Africans who want a narco communism. And he's trying to create an economic model that satisfies all of them. So at this point, Toussaint Lavature is gone. He's dead. He's dead. Dessalines is in charge, and he needs to figure out how to solve this problem. Correct. Okay. The first thing he does, he nationalizes all the land. First thing he does, he becomes emperor. Why does Des- Dessalines become emperor? This is very important. Some people think, oh, Dessalines became emperor because he was capping, copy capping, copycatting Napoleon because Napoleon made himself emperor first. What is the difference between an emperor and a king? Does anyone know? 
empire? No. An emperor, an emperor is the geostrategic military force in his region. Look up the definition. Okay. Napoleon made himself emperor. You know why that's important? Because the emperor is, is actually acknowledged by the religious power at that time. These are, people don't know this. When Dessalines, when Dessalines named himself emperor, the crown that he got came from Philadelphia, and they gave it to him. That's actually in C.L.R. James. They recognized him as emperor. Why? Because after Napoleon named himself emperor, the church recognized Napoleon. And why? Because Napoleon was the strongest military force in Europe at that point. Dessalines beat Napoleon. And Dessalines said, no, I'm the strongest. Make me emperor. And they did. That's why Dessalines made himself emperor. Okay. So now he's emperor. He's doing land reform. Well, he that first he nationalizes, he nationalizes everything. Right. He okay. nationalizes and he changes the agricultural production. No more sugarcane, which required the brutal corvée system that was semi-slavery. We're doing all coffee now. It's light work. Just pick up the coffee. You don't have to cut cane. No backbreaking work. Immediately, that makes every everyone's all of the Africans are happy. Yay! No more sugar. We're just doing coffee. Goodbye. And he added to the labor force by adding women. He changed the dynamics. All the men are in the military. Women, no matter what class you're in, no matter what color you are, you're picking coffee. Okay. You can't have a you can't have a corvée that brutalizes the women who are going to be giving birth to the future. So obviously there can be no brutal military, and plus that still allows the Africans to have their little agricultural laku system. They can have their anarcho communism. They're good to go. It's wonderful. The Af the the the, the uh, now he what he allows he allows the Gondon blacks to lease land from the state. No, he's not stupid. I said, I know you niggas want to own your own shit. I'll give you a hundred year lease, five percent, and rock out. A word, word, okay, bet. I get a lease on nationalized land. I can get some of these Africans. Listen, I'll give you 25%. Give me 20, no, give me 25% of what you make. You can keep 75 and you guys rock out, and I'll sell this out. So he's like, Oh, bet this is good. The Africans are not owning land per se, they're just doing their cooperative fund because they don't believe in own they, some of them don't even believe you can own land. And land comes from God. But they're able to have their own cooperative farms, run their shit. They don't have to work for either the light-skinned niggas. Well. So they're like, cool, they're rocking up. The mulattoes are like, hold on, you telling me that my mulatto wife has got to pick, uh, pick uh, coffee? Yes, motherfucker. Yes. Send that broad out into the coffee plantations. That starts a big problem. Because you know what else is happening? Napoleon is kicking all of the, the light-skinned Negroes out of France. They're either going to New Orleans or they're trying to come back to Haiti. Mm. And, and Dessalines is like, guess what? It ain't, it ain't the good old days anymore, Negroes. And all these brought the men are no problem. Hit the, hit the barracks. You're all in the military now. The women, go pick that, go pick that coffee. Well, before the women go pick coffee, Pascal, in closing, who did you write this for? I wrote this to change the paradigm of the Haitian Revolution for Haitian people to finally understand why their country is in this condition that it is right now. Why do you think that them understanding these two figures would help them now? Because they will understand that once Haiti, once uh, Petion, and Christophe allowed, once Christophe allowed Petion to assassinate, uh, it was a conspiracy where Christophe turned a blind eye, the black general turned a blind eye because he wants to go back to the good old days of mercantilism. Because this mm -hmm. is what I remember. We have the land is all nationalized. And mm -hmm. this only made one mistake. He made the mistake that Biggie Smalls warned. Bad boys move in silence. He didn't move in silence. He announced that he planned to do land reform. He shouldn't have announced anything. 
did that, not see that the was Biggie the mistake. Smalls. Did not see the Biggie Smalls reference coming. Did I did not either. That did was not see that coming. You kind of really I didn't between Wilson Phillips and Biggie Smalls <laughs> on this show today. Once he announced he was gonna do land reform, the person who was the most angry was not uh Christophe. Chris was like, eh, no problem. You know, the both sides in all in. Pet Sean is like, you're gonna tell me you're gonna have some of these African generals owning land with my light skinned wife picking coffee. Do they have a New York accent? No, but that's how we do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> really, we need to get an, a a play adaptation of that scene out. That's what we need to do with Jimmy Two Cents. We, we, yeah, Jimmy Two Cent. <laughs> <laughs> Pauly, fucking whack him. So they assassinate Dessaline. They don't do the land reform. No one wants to do it. And, and basically, to this day, seventy percent of Haitians own nothing because they're descended from the same African Bosal who never got anything because Dessalines, who was finally going to give them what they deserved, was taken out, and the country went into an immediate civil war with Christophe and his mercantilism at the top, and Petion doing a little land reform to his, like my ancestors, the colonels, and his friends, and trying to basically do trade and some farming, and then after they go, those guys dies, Boye comes in, and he agrees to the indemnity to France because he wants to get back with the French. By the way, how did Haiti get that indemnity to have to pay French? You know why? This is a very important. Petion, the bastard that he was, who was one of my ancestors, was offered by the French. We need first of all, they went to Christophe. Said, why? Because they still wanted Haiti to be a a a, a, a colony. The, the French were not giving up. They wanted Haiti to be a colony of France. And Christophe said, bring it on any day. We'll blow you away. And they said, well, Christophe, why don't you just pay us back the debt from the revolution and we recognize you? And he said, we would rather die fighting you here than think about that. Then they went to ask Petion. And then Petion says, uh, no, excuse me. Petion, Petion comes up with the idea of he comes up with the idea. Petion offers the French because he saw with Petion first because he wants to be French. Petion offers, well, why don't we set up a situation where we'll pay you for the losses because I can identify with them and we'll be, you know, subject to France. And he said, Would you agree with that? And Petion says, Yeah, I would. Then they go to Christophe and ask him, Would you agree with that? He said, Who would come up with that? Only a coward would do that, but we would fight you to death. And then the French tell Christophe, well, you know, Petion came up with the idea. And Petion and Christophe hate each other, largely out of color and all kinds of things. And Christophe said, what? Christophe humiliates Petion on the whole island by letting it be known that he agreed. He suggested to pay the French for Haitian liberty. He's humiliated because of that. Right? What? And... It, after Petro and Christophe were dead, Christophe, Petro dies in 1818, and then Boyer takes off this over the South. Boyer is one of those generals who left during the War of the Knives or the Civil War and went to France and came back to fight against Toussaint Louverture, right? Boyer, by the way, I have Boyer in my mother's side of the family. My mother has a Boyer in her side. <sighs> Tell me about it. Boyer takes over the South in 1818. Uh, Christophe is having rebellion in his area. He commits suicide and dies. In 1820, Boy controls the whole island. And in 1825, he said, the French come in and they have a ship. Instead of saying, well, we'll myself will take you like most of the black generals all this fight. He says, okay, we'll sign an indemnity and we'll be paying that until literally after my father was born. That's how long it takes Haiti to pay. That indemnity, that bill, that is the money that Haiti owes to France because right. of Petion. Correct. Okay. Because Petion came up with a suggestion. Christophe was like, you're out of your mind. And then they offered it to Y.A. And he said, yeah, sounds good to me. By the way, Y.A. didn't consult anyone before he accepted it. Yeah. That was <clears throat> super comprehensive. I just want to say 
this is why it's important for y'all to become patrons. This is why it's important for you to up your patronage if you're already a patron. Because I don't know where else you're going to get this. Super important. We love to do it. I just realized that. I got Y on my mother's side of the family. I got Petra on my father's side of the family. I got Desaline on my father's side of the family. I got two cent on my father's side of my family through my, my, my father's younger sister. Jesus. And you got a totally different last name. And my last and name you know what all that equals? You know what all that equals? What? A light-skinned Haitian in Miami with a parasol. And we are... <laughs> <laughs> Will we see you in the champagne room, Pascal? Yeah, I'll do a few minutes. All right. And <laughs> Tucson, you going to hang out with us in the champagne room? Yeah, if it, with my dad's sword. Yes. Oh, my God. And Pascal's parasol? <laughs> yes. Pascal, thank you very much. We look forward to when this finally comes out for the world. There's a lot of people that were commenting on they can't wait when it comes out as an essay and a little mini book. So eventually a book as well. Yeah. It's so I want to say this on air. I don't, I'm sure you don't remember this. When we first had our first discussion about doing this for real, I told you, I was like, we're going to get you published. Remember that? Well, Paul McComb is jumping in. So it's going to be Look, many more than you many. remember me. I didn't ask about that nigga. I've talked about me. Oh, oh. I'm oh. down, down there, muscles. <laughs> <laughs> we are Haitian. Ha, 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 ha.